Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, next lecture of um, our Double T College. And um, as you can see, the, the topic for this talk and lecture is on the science of disaster recovery. So before I get into a lot of details with regards to the actual topic, so uh, there will be some parts within the, the presentation where uh, I would love for you to participate in the discussion and then provide me with some feedback. And if you are, you are interested in doing that, you can um, text, uh, this is my first name, and the first letter of my last name, and then 800 altogether to this number. So, and you need to do this just once, and as soon as you do that, you will be connected to the online poll for this class. And then whenever there is a question, you can just text and then send, and you will, will see the result here on the screen. Hopefully that will be the case because that's uh, what I've done, um, what I've heard, and then uh, I, I checked and it works. So hopefully it will work too. So um, the first thing um, that I wanted to tell you about is like uh, the different part of this presentation, what, what I'm uh, going to uh, cover. So I will start first uh, with a little bit of information about myself, and then I will talk about motivation. So basically, uh, whatever I'm including here is part of uh, the research that I'm uh, doing, and eventually this research is going to uh, be formulated as a syllabus for a class. And um, so, um, I will talk about uh, uh, myself, the motivation for this study, the approach that me and my team uh, we use in order to address the, all the objectives of this research, which would be my graduate students and undergraduate students, uh, some of uh, whom are here in this uh, lecture as well. And then uh, I will share with you some of the results that uh, we, we have got so far. And then finally, we will have the Q&A. So let's start with the first part, which is uh, like a little bit of information about myself. So my name is Ali Najat, and I'm an associate professor of uh, civil, environmental, and construction engineering in the Department of Civil Engineering. And um, well, it is in the, um, if you don't know where the location of the civil engineering building is, is that uh, the, the north of the engineering uh, key. So, and my background, my uh, bachelor's and master's is in civil engineering, but my PhD was in construction engineering and management, which actually has a little bit of managerial taste to the civil engineering part of it. And, um, and it's <coughs> kind of interesting because whenever uh, you talk to someone about you being a civil engineer, the first thing that comes to their mind is that whether you do like a structural analysis, do the, the uh, design of the building or do pavement, but I don't do any of those. So uh, the major thing that I do is I try to do research on the intersection of uh, engineering and social science. And I guess uh, that's the reason that um, the type of work that you will see today is kind of different from uh, what you would expect to see from a civil engineer in general. And um, so as you can see, these are my research interests. So I'm very much interested in knowing how people recover after disaster and what are the ways that we can actually model that so that eventually we as policyholder, we can use that data and come up with a better way that the community can recover and um, try to enhance the recovery in general. And um, as I mentioned, uh, the majority of this lecture is based on uh, two grants that I was able to receive uh, from NSF on this topic. And as you can see, one of them is a rapid award, which is mainly uh, for data collection. And then the second one is the, the one that I actually used, uh, me and my student used, uh, in order to come up with the model. So, um, and uh, all these awards were um, provided by National Science Foundation, which is a federal entity which is responsible, not responsible, uh, uh, which actually provides research money to the, uh, anything other than medical science related type of research. Okay, so let's talk about the motivation. So, um, when I started um, my, um, like a assignment as a assistant professor here at Tech. So it was uh, in 2011, but then uh, we had Sandy, like a 
kind of immediately afterwards. Uh, and then I was just thinking about, okay, um, we always talk about recovery and I'll, we always talk about what are the ways, what are the best policies that we can use in order to uh, make people to reconstruct and they go back to their uh, residences and build their places. But all the time, the way we were looking at this problem was a kind of a top bottom type of approach. And so in other words, we were just thinking as policy holders, okay, let's just restore the, uh, all the infrastructure. Let's restore the pavement. Let's like uh, restore the, the hospitals. And then uh, expecting that by doing that, people make a decision of going back and then reconstruct their buildings and their houses and everything will go back to its normalcy. But how many of you think that this is actually what, uh, the, the actual scenario that happens in reality. Okay, so we have this one. So uh, it, it seems like that we are all on the same page. So because in reality, uh, this is not the case. So, and I'll give you an example. So you remember that I was telling you that the first research uh, fund that I got from NSF was a RAPID award. And the reason it is, it is uh, called RAPID is because it's mainly data collection. And the idea is that if you don't go and collect data as fast as possible, that per perishable data will go away. And we exactly did the same thing uh, in 2012 uh, for Hurricane Sandy that uh, we went to Staten Island and we actually uh, uh, went to people's houses and then, well, at that time, especially the, the neighborhoods that we went to, there were no house, houses to begin with. So we were talking with people in shelters and then trying to see what are the things that will make them to come back and reconstruct. So, so we were collecting a lot of data. And then while doing that data collection, we face a lot of contradicting scenarios. So one example was that there was a house which was like completely damaged. And then uh, we were talking, so normally what you would ex uh, expect for the owner to do is at least to wait for some f uh, financial support, either, uh, either from federal entities or from state, so that they, they can recover. But they were saying that even though that there is nothing, there has been nothing left from the house, we're going to rebuild the house no matter how and uh, when. But, and the reason is that this was our house for the past 20 years, and this is going to be our house for the rest of our life. So what they were referring to is the term that we use in uh, social science and then in the domain of recovery as social attachment or, or location bonding and location attachment. So. That was one scenario, and then completely opposite to that, we have a house which was in a completely perfect shape, but the people of that house, they went through a lot of hardship that they didn't want to stay there, so that they, uh, that would be a reminder of what they gone through day to day. And so they were making a decision just to go away, to go to somewhere else. So some of those occasions was to lose a family member or to be like significantly effect affected uh, psychologically by the disaster. So they were saying, no, there's no way that we can be here anymore. So as you can see, it is not as easy to come up with a, a disaster recovery plan, which can be very thorough and comprehensive, and then making sure that everyone will follow the exact same rules. So uh, basically, if I want to summarize everything that I just mentioned, is that there is a gap for the social aspect to be looked through and then eventually be integrated in the recovery planning. So that was the reason that we th thought about the need for a bottom-up approach. So instead of we designing, we as policyholders coming up with all those uh, beautiful policies, hoping that everyone will do it, let's just look at the, the situation from people's eye and see what they need based on like uh, their characteristics they're whatever they they, they are uh, they are and then eventually uh, try to come up with uh, with policies that can uh, resonate with their expectation and eventually make the recovery faster so of course in doing that uh, we face a lot of challenges so the first one was complexity so just imagine that you wanted to uh, model your own day-to-day behavior. So what you're going to do when you're being exposed to something random. So it would be very hard. And uh, so it's very complex. So you need to come up with something which can be modeled. So which would require some um, 
um, assumption to make it a little bit simpler, but then at the same time, at least provide you with some trend based on which you can do policy planning. And then we needed some data so that we can eventually, the model that we uh, make can be verified so that we know that uh, the outcome that we are getting is something reliable so that you can eventually use that for some other occasions. And then also finding out uh, what are the things that we need to in include in our model. So that was the reason that we thought about uh, agent-based modeling approach to be the best um, method in order to do that. And before I go into more detail about what an agent-based approach is, I'm going to sh show you two simulations. And these are agent-based approach and agent-based simulations. And one of them is trying to show you why, um, let me ask you this question. How many of you have seen flock of birds flying in a V-shape? And uh, you always wonder why is a V-shape, why is not some other type of... Uh, like forms. Okay, any answers to it? So one of them will show you that with very, very simple rules, you can actually come up with, the, with that result. So I will tell you what those uh, simple rules are that you can actually simulate the same uh, kind of shape that you see for that flock of bird uh, moving and migrating. And then the second one would be another simulation, and you will see that the code for all these simulations is probably five or six lines, so it's not as com uh, complicated at all. But even uh, just uh, even though that it's not complicated, it is uh, capable of providing a very very sophisticated model that you can use for your um, decision making. And the second model would be uh, the simulation of how ants find their food and eventually tell other ants to go because if I, I don't know if you have seen this in reality or not so uh, you see that uh, if there is a source of food somewhere you first see one or two just going toward the food and then after like 10 minutes you see that there is a lot of ants all over the, that food making sure that it's gone and then they will move uh, move on to somewhere else so just look at these and hopefully this will work Okay, so this is the first one. So as you see, uh, they started from a very random location, but in like a matter of seconds, they ended up moving, uh, first of all, together, and then having a shape like a, a V-shape that you normally see. And this is the other one. So here we have uh, the the main residence of the, the ants. And then those like blue spots are the food. And as you see, uh, they will just find them and then consume it and they move on to the, to the next. So um, just um, by looking at this, you can tell that agent-based approach would be able to model something very, very complicated. And at the same time, you can do this with a very limited code and by very simplistic rules. So just to give you an example, for the first model, if I uh, go back, for this one, the only thing that was done for this simulation was to generate this point randomly and then uh, assign them three simple rules. First, if you are like moving random and if you don't see any bird in front of you, continue moving, D do nothing. But if, if you see, so and uh, as you can see here, there is a, a vision distance. So this can be changed too if you wanna see how uh, changes in your vision can eventually change this shape. But eventually it's not gonna change the overall, the nature of the, the problem. And then the second rule would be, uh, okay, so if you see a bird that is, is within your vision, then just try to get close to it. And the reason that birds does that, because they want it to be free rider. Who doesn't want to be a free rider if it is available for them? So they will just go behind uh, the, the front uh, bird so that they can use uh, the updraft that, that they are creating so that they don't uh, use a lot of energy to continue moving. And then um, the third rule is that they need to have their own site. So their site needs not to be blocked. So they will end up standing either on the right or on the left. So if you do that, you see that you will see uh, completely wishing. And then uh, on the, the other simulation, 
again, the rules are very simple too. Uh, so the way it works is that the ants, they start to uh, move randomly. And as soon as they reach to the food, they start to release some kind of chemicals. And, the, and then that chemicals make other ants to follow the same route. And the more the, the, the ants follow the, uh, that path, the more the intense would be uh, that chemical. And that's why you see the more ants like covering that food and eventually consuming that. So um, following this uh, simple method, um, Let's just go back to the definition of agent-based approach and agents in general. So as you can see, agents, uh, they are very simple in terms of how they react and how they uh, perform in an agent-based framework. So agents basically are an entity that have some sensors and with that sensors, they see and perceive their neighborhood. And then, based on that perception, they do some actions, which that action will change the environment. And that environment changes its perception, and it goes on and on and on. And of course, we have different types of agents. Each one of them will respond to a different types of tasks. And, um, and we will talk about that in more detail um, uh, as we go through the, the model. I want to see if I have one. Uh, first of all, let me ask this question. Uh, were you able to text uh, this to text? Okay, so let's see. So let's just start with the first one. Uh, this is the kind of a um, first time that I'm using this, so hopefully this will work. So my question is here, uh, let me just uh, make it online. Okay, so now I should be able to receive that. So based on... Uh, everything that uh, we uh, saw so far, why do you think that agent-based approach uh, would be a good choice for this uh, model or for this uh, modeling task? And it can be just like one sentence, it can be like a, a line, and you can just text it, and then I will get back to this later. So um, whenever you have time, you can just provide me some uh, feedback, and then we will talk about it uh, as we go on. So let me go back to uh, this. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, so we have different types of agents. And each one of them, they can have different tasks. So we have a simple reflex agent, which can be a mail uh, sorting robot, which is basically it, uh, action and reaction. So it is being provided with some letters and then the only things that he or or it or whatever it is uh in this case it's uh, i guess it was a um a ufo or something uh, so anyway um the only thing that um he does is just to sort that and then nothing else so it's a simple reflex agent then the other one can be a model based reflex agent which is like a house cleaning robot the only difference between the two is that this one has a model based on which it's, it does its action. So for example, if it reaches to the wall, then it knows that it needs to change its direction and go somewhere else. So basically it has a history that, he, uh, that this agent will keep. And then we have a goal-based reflex agent where uh, in which unlike the other ones, it can have multiple goals. So like a housekeeper robot, which can do your uh, dishes, can you your clothes, and, and all that. So as long as those are checked, uh, it's fine. And then finally, we can have a utility-based agent where you have a measure of goodness. So, and then based on measure of good, goodness, at each time frame, you just go back and measure yourself that how good you are. And if you're not as good as what you expect, then you change your action. And this can be an example of like a uh, autonomous vehicle can be an, an example of that, where uh, the measure of goodness is, for example, the time that it will take from that autonomous vehicle to go from point A to point B, but then uh, considering that everyone in the car needs to be safe and then maximizing their, uh, the velocity of, of that autonomous vehicle. So by doing that, you always check, okay, uh, I'm paying, uh, just by paying attention to all the speed limits and the safety, am I using, am I going with the maximum speed possible or not? And you always can go back and change, change it accordingly to make sure that you reach to the distance as soon as possible. So as you can see, for this one, 
the answer is not yes or no. It's just always it changes. And because you are trying to maximize your measure of goodness, which in this uh, case would be the time that you will arrive to your destination. So any questions so far with regard to uh, the things that we talked about? Okay. So, um, so far what we talked about was the motivation and our approach. So we ended up reaching to the decision that, okay, so if you want to do this, since it is a, a complicated uh, process, uh, why don't we just use agent-based modeling and then try to come up with some simplistic rules to be eventually able uh, to uh, simulate the, the complicated nature of disaster and disaster recovery afterwards. So um, using that agent-based modeling approach, we uh, ended up with four different problems and challenges that needed to be addressed before you actually perform that agent-based model. So the first thing, as you can see, is the data. And you always need data to make sure that the model that you are preparing or developing is uh, working, because otherwise there's no way for you to compare. Then um, choosing your agent type, what kind of agent you want to put in your model in order to replicate what you see in reality what kind of attributes those agents needs to have. So for example, some of the attributes that we had in, in the autonomous vehicle would be, for example, the, the autonomous vehicle speed, the autonomous uh, vehicle uh, distance, and we can have the same thing uh, for this case as well. And finally, uh, how those agents interact with each other. So if we put these agents in a framework, how we are expecting them to interact with each other and how uh, this can be modeled. So we ended up addressing those problems using data collection and surveys, data analysis, model development and, and validation, the detail of uh, which I have included here. So um, as you can see, this is one of the data collection that we did. In this specific research, we wanted to find out that um, Okay, so when you are making a decision about uh, re recovery of your house, first of all, what, what is the definition of a neighborhood to you? Because we have a lot of literature in disaster recovery domain that they're saying that when you wanted to recover, if everyone around you, they, they just want to uh, relocate or they, they don't want to uh, recover, they just want to wait, those would be kind of a negative signals to you. So you probably would wait too or you would relocate. So if that's the case, then what would be the def definition of uh, neighborhood. So that would be my questions for you as well. Um, okay, so um, I'm glad that um, I got these as well. Everything that I'm here uh, seeing here as why agent-based approach was a, a good approach uh, is exactly right. And so yes, it helps analyze people reaction, it's simple and easy to code, uh, you can do behavioral. And now uh, the, the other question that I had was, what is the uh, definition of neighborhood? Uh, let me see if I have it here. And I um, appreciate if you can provide me, L let me just wait a little bit uh, to see your uh, responses so that we can be synced instead of just waiting a little bit. So. Um, Let's just wait to see what kind of responses I will get, because this is very important. Uh, of what is a definition of neighborhood when you think about it? Because if you're saying that neighborhood and the spe spatial effect influence your decision, that's perfectly fine. But is it going to be like 100 meters, 1200 meters? Is it a matter of distance? Is it a matter of what? Is it a matter of uh, like the city? Okay. Yes. So uh, some of the things that we're seeing, yes. Yes, those are all of them. Honestly, we don't have an answer for this. So, and that was one of the reasons that we ended up doing this research because I was like asking all like the senior members that we have in the domain of disaster recovery, and I was telling them, okay, so what is the definition of neighborhood and neighbors to begin with? And nobody has a single. Yeah, awesome. I, I really like the the fact that we have community because. 
Oh, th th that is very correct. But then at the same time, it's subjective too, because what do you call a community? So uh, we are actually uh, kind of defining one term with another term, and both of them are kind, kind of subjective. Joe, yes, geographic is uh, uh, something that you can be at least a little bit more objective than um, people surrounding shared drive. Yes, so these are like the geographical feature ecosystem people yes perfect uh, thank you so much for all this feedback and we did exactly the same thing so what we did uh thank you appreciate the, the feedback let me go back to um this and so uh, this was the data collection that we did in uh, new york and louisiana and the reason that we did that of, uh, in those two states was that they were affected by Hurricane Katrina and Sandy, which were like the two top uh, hurricane that we have, we had. And um, so that was the way that we, we did this. So we actually code Google map and we manipulate Google map in a way that we can use all the data uh, for our own purposes. So the first question that they were getting was, okay, so type your location, the location of your residence, and we didn't want them to just write everything. We, we just want them to provide this visually. So uh, they um, searched for their location of residence. And then the next question was that using this polygon tool, uh, draw a, a line or a polygon around the, the neighborhood or around the area which you believe is your neighborhood. And then we use that data eventually to find out, okay, and then, uh, so they were also providing us with their internal attribute as well. And what I mean by internal attribute is their demographic and also their socioeconomic status. So that was uh, like a very good tool for us to eventually link those internal attributes with how they perceive their neighborhood. So ev eventually, just by doing this, we were able to come up uh, with a model which can get some inputs as, okay, so what is your race? What is your uh, age? What is your like uh, socioeconomic status? And then uh, the um, dependent variable or the outcome of that model was that, okay, how big is your neighborhood? And someone might ask, okay, even if we know how big is the neighborhood, how this can help with regard to policymaking. So if, for example, I know there is a uh, Mr. A, or Mrs. B, that they're residing within this area, how this can help me in terms of com coming up with a better uh, recovery planning uh, strategy. So the answer to this is that uh, um, when you think about it, uh, we did another uh, kind of a statistical analysis and we found out that the, the, the bigger the area of your perceived neighborhood, the more would be the items that are important to you. So for example, if you have uh, like a, a, a greater perceived neighborhood, then the probability of you caring about churches, about schools, about highways, about parks would be much higher than a person that who would uh, uh, that uh, have a, like a very limited uh, perceived neighborhood. We also had cases that they were saying that, uh, in my opinion, neighborhood doesn't have any meaning. So I don't have a neighborhood so the, among the, the responses that we were getting. So some of them they were saying that, so it would be like a, probably two feet or like a couple of uh, uh, blocks from me. So. That's how you can use that information, saying that if, if a person uh, has a larger perceived neighborhood, that would be a good indica indication that they would care more about everything that they have around them. So and these are like uh, the data that we collected. And then we did some other data collection as well to find out uh, what are the, those uh, relocation decisions that we'll talk about um, next. So. So far, we talked about, we use agent-based approach and, um, as our methodology, we did the data. And now the other problem that we had was the interaction. So now that we have all these agents in our agent-based model, how we want to uh, model their interaction, okay? So in other words, let me um, give you an example. So just imagine that you are, you, you are one of the, 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 the uh, households within a, a community that was affected by disaster and then 
all of your neighbors, they have been affected as well. So now you are thinking whether to reconstruct or not. So the first thing that comes to your mind is that, shall I reconstruct first so that everyone around me use this as a positive signal, knowing that, okay, everybody is like making a decision to reconstruct and reconstruct accordingly? Or would it be better for me to wait and let them reconstruct so that I can get a positive signal and then I can reconstruct later. So what will happen is that because since you are waiting, if you wanted to like wait and let them reconstruct, you are getting some valuable information for which you're paying. And that paying is like you going to a temporary housing, which can be a hotel or anything else. So, and game theory is something which uh, is a tool uh, which actually provides you with this option to be able to model this. So in game theory, what we talk about is that you always see yourself in a game between your, you and your competitors, and you always will choose the strategy which would um, basically maximize your payoff. So I'm going to give you an example before, before going back to the, the rebuild and re relocate system uh, that we have for recovery. So. Uh, in game theory, we have a very, uh, very, very famous uh, model, which is called, or problem, which is called prisoner's dilemma. So what it talks about is that there are like two robbers. Just imagine that there were two robbers that they were caught uh, after doing a robbery, and all of them are being interrogated separately uh, in a like a in, in a room. And as you can see, there are different payoffs associated with different actions. So we have. Um, the prisoner B, which has two options, either to confess, and conf confessing means that saying that the other person actually did it, or uh, remaining silent, and then prisoner A has the same uh, thing as well. They can either confess, saying that the other person has done it, or remain silent. So as you can see, if both of them say the other one ha did it, they will get five-year sentence. If both of them remain silent, they get one year. If uh, uh, prisoner A say that, um, uh, let me see. Uh, yes, say, uh, remain silent, then uh, the other one uh, confess, the other one will uh, be free, the other one uh, will remain uh, in jail for another 20 years, and the same thing applies uh, if they uh, do the exact opposite. So just by looking at this, can you tell me if you were, since this is a symmetric game, so it doesn't really matter if you are prisoner A or prisoner B, if you are, God forbid, prisoner A or B, which one, which strategy would you choose? Would you choose to confess or would you choose to remain silent? And then you can answer this here too. Okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So A would be confess, and then B would be silent. Would you do A or would you do B? So uh, silent. Okay, so and then there is a, a good. Con no, no. I, I wanted to say that there is a very good consensus with it. Okay, now sixty-four, thirty-six. Okay. 67. So still s remaining silent seems like to be the answer. Okay, so thank. Oh, let me see what happened. Okay. Are you good? Okay, let's let's go back to um, the the result. Okay, so if you look at it, um, just imagine that you are, for example, prisoner A. So if you choose to confess then prisoner B will either get five years or will get 20 years. So prisoner B would be better off if uh, he or she uh, confesses as well. And then if prisoner A uh, remains silent, prisoner B either gets zero year or one year. And again, confess would be a better option. So when you put this all together, for both of them, they would be better off to confess rather than to remain silent. And when you think about it, each one of them, um, they are better off, for example, uh, going for this strategy, but the fact that they are thinking that their player is thinking the same way, they will go with the strategy which is not necessarily a maximum payoff, but then it would be uh, like a, 
uh, a good payoff for both of them that are within the game. And that's how you make your decision when you are in the game. Now, let's go back to our uh, rebuild relocation case uh, where you have, um, again, if both of the, you and your neighbor, if both of you rebuild, just imagine that the value of, of your house is five. Both of you will get five. If both of you relocate, since you need to pay for the expenses, then both of you will get three, which would be like a little bit less than five. But then if one relocate, the other one rebuild, it would be two and zero. And then again, the same thing for um, uh, the other case. So now if you look at this, it is more complicated than that the, the previous matter. So because you might think that, okay, so rebuild and rebuild would be a better option, which is not because in this case, we don't have a, a single strategy which can give you the results. So just to give an example, if a player A do rebuild, then player B would be better off to rebuild as well. And then if player A uh, relocate, then player B would be better off if you relocate. So as you can see, the, the outcome for the first scenario is not the same as the outcome for the second scenario. So in those cases, instead of having uh, a pure strategy, then we will have a mixed strategy, which will give you something like this, saying that, okay, so in 50% of the time, you need to rebuild, and in 50% of the time, you need to relocate. And when it comes to reality, if I really wanted to simulate that in re reality, I should uh, use a coin and then see if it's heads, then I will rebuild. If it's tails, then I do relocate. So that was the way that we ended up. Of course, it was more complicated than what you see here. Uh, that was the way we ended up coming up with like some probability so that uh, these uh, uh, agents, they can interact with each other. So we talked about the interaction. We, talk, uh, we also talked about what should be the agent types. So based on the types that we talked about so far, so we said uh, we, we can have simple reflex, we can have model base, we, have, we can have gold base, and we can have utility base. Which one of those agent types you think would be a better option for this modeling uh, purpose? So how many think that uh, simple reflex would be the best option? Um, what about the model base reflex? Okay, so what about the goal base? Okay, and what about the utility base? Okay, yes, the answer um, well, actually, you can do all of those uh, agent types and use all of them in, in that, but then you would be better off if you use utility base because you want your agents to do interaction all the time and make their decision accordingly. So in other words, you want uh, the whole thing to be dynamic so that they have a, uh, like a measure of goodness where they can do stuff and then measure that toward like, the optimum and then make decisions accordingly. And finally, uh, the attributes, which is uh, a little bit complicated, and um, these are the things that we eventually ended up using for every agent, which are like demographic, socioeconomic status, psychosocial, and also uh, what should be the internal factor and what should be the external factor. So now that we, we were able to address all the, the challenges in our approach, then we ended up having some results. So uh, for the perceived neighborhood, as I mentioned, we f found out that there are two parameters that are important in uh, making you defining a larger or a smaller area. And of course, this is uh, just a, a case study, so it's, it is not necessarily um, extendable to other situation. But at the same time, it was uh, informative as well. So uh, as you can see, uh, the first thing that was important and significant in changing your uh, view of perceived neighborhood is the density. And uh, as you can see, uh, so the S ESD1, uh, it, it shows you that um, um, the smaller area uh, that is defined by um, census bureau. Then we have, which is like a block level, then we have block group level, then we have census track, 
and then we have more than sensor stripe. So as we go from one to four, the area gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So as you can see, the more dense an environment, uh, then you see the less people that would be uh, somehow related to the first group, which have a smaller perceived area, and you have the more people to be uh, part of the, uh, the fourth group, which have a larger area. So in other words, as, as you live in a denser area, you would ex expect to have a larger uh, perceived uh, neighborhood. And then the other one is whether you are married or you're not. And then as you can see, uh, the way things changes in married and unmarried is pretty much similar with a very uh, minor differences between the, the density. So uh, in general, uh, the density would, uh, would be uh, very um, like influential in how you see your uh, neighborhood. And then we talked about the policy issue of how this can help you. As you mentioned, that the larger the area that you have, the more items that would be important for you. So that it, so that eventually, if me as a policyholder wanted to come up with a policy plan, then I would uh, require that, that policy to be more comprehensive. If we are talking about the people who uh, belong to that group, and um, one of the other things that we did was. Uh, in our data collection, we also asked them, okay, so in that perceived neighborhood, what were the major things that you included? So was it a church, was it a school? And there were like 17 different, different factors that we asked them for them to check. So, and using that and using some statistical analysis, we found out that, that among all those 17 factors, we can have two, like an aggregate type of factor, which would be like an infrastructure related type of factors and then social network uh, related type of factor. And based on that, we were able to uh, use an index for the, uh, the different counties that we had uh, in, in the state of New York. So the goal was that eventually we can use this modeling tools so that we can use the same index for all the counties that we have within the U.S., not necessarily in the um, uh, New York. And uh, the usage for this index would be that if you are, for example, a social network aware class, then you would be mainly uh, caring about um, probably having a school near to, to um, your place or like being close to your social network. And then uh, if you are part of the infrastructure of your class, then you definitely wanted to see, for example, uh, restoration of infrastructure happening around you. And those would be the things that you would be sensitive in order for you to make a recovery decision to, to come back. And... Um, and we did the same thing uh, uh, with the relocation. And finally, the last thing that we did was that uh, we tried to use social media and see how social media can inform us, uh, inform us of people's priority for disaster and disaster recovery. So um, we collect, uh, actually th that was, uh, the majority of this work uh, was done by uh, my graduate students uh, with the help of undergraduates as well. So uh, for this, uh, and for which I'm very thankful as well. So the, in the social media case, uh, we actually collected data and then we wanted to see how this data that, that we can get from, for example, Twitter can be informative uh, for us to know what are the needs of people immediately after disaster, like a year after disaster, and for example, two years after disaster, how these priorities change changes over time. And finally, uh, we use all that to come up with that agent-based model. Of course, this is... Uh, in its early, early stages, but it will get more complicated as we include all the results here. So I'm gonna, um, and this is again, um, a work of one of my graduate students. So as you can see, this is, um, here you see like uh, all the houses and then there are like a infrastructure being embedded in that as well. And now we are seeing how making changes in like different parameters that we have will eventually affect the overall recovery rate within that area. So in this case, we just included two major uh, parameters. The first thing was the spatial factor, like uh, the importance of a uh, uh, neighboring like household uh, on you making a decision and also the importance of having uh, a recovered or restored infrastructure. And you can see in this simulation, what I tried to show in this uh, um, 
simulation is that if we uh, change the infrastructure recovery duration from 8 to 24 months, so uh, uh, it means that uh, we are expecting the infrastructure to be built very soon. And if the infrastructure is being built very soon, you would expe uh, expect to have a higher recovery rate rather than having your re uh, infrastructure being restored much later. So. This is what actually you're seeing right now. So if I click again here, the first thing is in this case, infrastructure, let's, let's see. Uh, recovery duration is eight months. You see that 81% uh, have recovered. Now if you change eight months to 36 months, meaning that it will uh, uh, took um, three years, then you see that the recovery will drop to 59%. And that's because when you make a decision, you not, not only uh, care about what is happening around you, but also you care about the availability of uh, infrastructure as well. So, and this is um, a kind of a, a re uh, the same results that you can see uh, where here we have the uh, percentage of initial construction. If you change the percentage, of course, you will get, so the, what basically this means is that if you start with like 250 houses at the beginning, uh, what will happen versus if you start with like 750 at the beginning, what will happen? And this is the recovery duration of a uh, household, and this is the overall recovery that you get. And as you can see, the more percentage or the higher the percentage of initial reconstruction, the higher would be the, um, the overall recovery in the community. So if I want to use this result for policy, uh, making, I can say, okay, so from uh, what we saw, it, you see at the beginning, these blue ones are the ones that are already recovered, which we included there as the, the initial recovered houses. So I can increase those in order to make sure that all of them will recover eventually. And this can be one, like one policy of, uh, that can be done in order to make sure that there would be 100% recovery within the community. And um, I guess I'm almost done. Yes, so um, this is uh, basically what I wanted to uh, include in this presentation. I'm hopefully this wasn't like a too much. And um, it, it was like a work of probably a couple of years uh, to be um, like shortened in probably in an hour. So, uh, but I completely understand if there are lots of questions and, and I can um, answer question for another eight minutes, I, I believe. And if you have further like uh, questions or if you want to follow up, this is my email. You can always email me. And then if you're interested in engine-based model in general, uh, I have a good news for you. So uh, we are actually working on uh, offering this course in the fall. And so if you're interested, you can either contact me and, um, or you can just um, go and sign up for the course. So um, if you have any questions, I'm all ears. Um, okay. Was the study just based in the US? Yes, uh, so everything that we have done so far, uh, well, actually we have, been, we, we tried to be kind of comprehensive in the disasters that uh, we had in the U.S. So we had hurricanes, we had more tornado, but yes, all of them, they were in the U.S. So we never had a chance so far to include any international event, but that definitely would be one of the things that we will pursue in the future. Yeah, and the reason why I asked the question, because Japan, it's one of the countries in terms of hurricane. Yes. Yes. You see, uh, well, um, actually what we did, we uh, wanted to at some point to include some international event as well. The problem that we had was the, the data availability that we have in the U.S. is not comparable to other countries. So if you want to do modeling and you, you are relying uh, some of the, those data to be available to you from census, if you don't have the same, I mean, they have their own census, but it is not as um, accessible as, uh, or at least that was my perception, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, you showed a diagram uh, showing the slope of the recovery, uh -huh. uh, and it was a point that the slope increased after what? Right. Uh, is it a specific point? Uh, it was a well, this is actually, uh, the, um, the, I'm glad that you mentioned this because um, this is actually one of the main reason that we um, use agent-based modeling because sometimes there are some hidden uh, like um, rules, not hidden rules, but hidden uh, characteristics in your model that you won't be able to find out unless you do a simulation. So this is at the tipping point of the overall 
um, settings that we have in that agent-based model, which actually shows that when you reach this point, this slope completely change. And this would be uh, mainly reliant on how we um, initiate our agent and then how the interaction happened in first place. So uh, by changing that, you will see that this tipping point changes and goes somewhere else. And for us, or maybe uh, it's better to say for policyholder, it's always good to find out where that tipping point is based on uh, that initial setting so that they can like um, target and address that point when they are doing the calculation. So by these uh, tipping points, you suggest some policies? Yes. So are you doing this research to like inform insurance policies or to figure out how cities should be built in the future? future and like how they should yeah, well, well the main idea was to, to the, for this to be used for uh, policy making and uh, urban planning so I would say the second but I, I I'm sure that it can be used for the first purpose as well. So uh, the idea initially was that we can come up with a decision support tool where you as a policy maker you can just uh, put all the information for your community, for your city, whatever it is, and it will provide you with a rank order um, policy or uh, like recovery policy that would be best for your uh, specific community. So for example, if you have, so remember we were talking about having an index, so some people are infrastructure aware, some people are social network aware. So if you find out that your uh, community, the majority of the people, they are social network aware, then you know that the majority of the, the fund that has been allocated for that disaster, and we know that there is a always for it, so it's a very limited fund, mm -hmm. needs to be uh, mainly spent on those cases in order to guarantee a maximum recovery. Because if you uh, generalize the, the, the the, the whole policy saying that okay we'll do this for everywhere then it's not gonna you don't get the maximum result for all of them. Any other questions? Okay so um, thank you so much for um, attending and for listening to this hopefully that was uh, uh, kind of informative and thank you. let me know if you have any questions